Some might be asking today, somebody asked me in the first service, Pastor, why are you wearing a, a sweat track suit today? I want to tell you why I'm running today. You know, 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 24 says, run that you may obtain the prize. I don't want to start this race and not finish this race. How I many know, like when I sign up for Jesus, I want to get to Jesus. And, and, and I want to tell you, like what I'm going to share today, I pray just encourages your run today, encourages your journey in your faith as we dig in today to the evidence behind the resurrection of Jesus. How many have been enjoying this series so far? And, and I, in this series, I think we've not only cornered atheism, I think we've crushed it uh, in just the arguments that have been presented. And mind you, there are thousands of other arguments that exist to bring atheism, atheism to its knees. And, and as we hone in and focus on Jesus today, we're gonna answer two questions. Uh, the first two questions we're gonna answer is this. Did Jesus live? And if so, did he resurrect? Did he really come back from the dead? What evidence is there behind that? We're not just gonna release faith to be our answer. What evidence is there behind these claims? Because if we can answer these two questions, not only will it validate your belief in Christ, but it will give you a confidence and an ability to defend these beliefs in the wake of attacks that say that Jesus didn't live or attacks that say he did live, but he was just an ordinary man. And that through folklore and exaggerated and legendary tales that were added to him later on down the road of history, he has become to be known as what we know him today. Uh, so we're gonna tackle those those issues and give you an ability to defend those attacks with your faith. So let's dig into these two questions. The, the first one being, did Jesus Christ of Nazareth live? And to answer that, we need historical evidence that shows that Jesus Christ lived and that Jesus Christ lived in the time period that we claim that he lived in. Now, we could, of course, hold up a Bible and say, we possess all the answers we need on that question right there. Of course he lived. It says here that he lived, and that would be true because what we hold in our hands when it comes to the Bible, uh, just aside from a faith context, the Bible is absolutely one of the most historically validated historical documents that exist in all of the world, and, and we're gonna dig into that heavily next week, but We'll touch a little bit on that briefly today, but for the sake of critical argument, let's look at non-Christian sources that claim that Jesus Christ actually lived. Non-Christian sources. In, in AD 66, let's go all the way back, um, Jews in Palestine decided to revolt against Roman rule. Now, mind you, at this time, Rome was next level. Rome was a bloodthirsty world power in conquest in search of world domination. They placed military oppression on many nations around the known world in that time, Israel included in that bunch that they oppressed. And because of that, a lot of nations didn't like that, obviously, specifically Israel, because the Jews were very proud of their nation, understandably. They were disgusted with Roman oppression and rule, and so Israel would at times revolt and rebel against that Roman rule. And in AD 66, Israel is revolting against Rome uh, in some of their towns, and, and of course the Romans don't appreciate this necessarily too much either, and so once word of their revolt reached Rome, Rome responds by sending armies to Israel led by a general by the name of Vespasian. He was, ended up becoming the emperor of Rome later on because of his successes in military conquest. But Vespasian and his armies arrived there in AD 67. Come on, they just didn't have planes and trains. They, it took them a little bit to get over there. And when they got there, they laid flat towns. I mean, they laid siege to these villages and cities that were, that, that were rebelling against Roman rule. And, 
And, and so on the 47th day of that siege, I mean, imagine just 47 days pummeling cities. On the 47th day of that siege, they're in the town of Jepada outside of Galilee, and they corner this, this, this Jewish like little, 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 little rebel. And they, of course, do what everybody does. They say, quit doing it or we're gonna kill you. Will you resign your allegiance to your country and, 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 and re resume your allegiance to Rome? And this little Jewish rebel decides to surrender. Now, a lot of Jewish rebels didn't do that. They said, you know, they, they brave-hearted it. They're like, no, kill me. I'm not gonna ever serve you. And so they would kill him, but this Jewish rebel surrendered. And uh, later on, this Jewish rebel grew to actually be liked through the ranks of Rome's armies, and he actually grew to be liked by General Vespasian himself. And he was actually taken back to Rome by General Titus, who was Vespasian's son, and grew to really become a big part of Rome's historian context. This little Jewish rebel's name was, was Flavius Josephus. Uh, he lived AD 37 to 100. And he ended up becoming what many consider to be the greatest Jewish historian of all time. He began his historical writings in Rome, and it was there where he wrote the most famous autobiographical work uh, on Israel called The Antiquities of the Jews, which he finished in about AD 93. Now, Josephus wasn't a Christian. I, I wanna make this clear. But he, Josephus, who was not a Christian, writes these words in book 18, chapter three and section three of the Antiquities of the Jews. He said these words. At this time, the time of Pilate, there was a wise man who was called Jesus. His conduct was good, and he was known to be virtuous. And many people from among the Jews and other nations became his disciples. Pilate condemned him to be crucified and to die. But those who had become his disciples did not abandon their discipleship. They reported that Jesus appeared to them three days after his crucifixion and that he was alive. Accordingly, he was perhaps the Messiah concerning whom their prophets have recounted wonders. End quote. Now, this wasn't Josephus' only mention of Jesus. Later, Josephus mentions the brother of Jesus and names him James and writes that James was killed because of his faith in Jesus by the Sanhedrin Council in AD 62. So, so, so here's what I'm saying. Here, here we have this, in this one example, an authentic first century non-Christian reference to the existence of Jesus and confirmation that he had a brother named James. Now, if you include Josephus, hang with me here, there are 10 non-Christian known, 10 non-Christian writers who mentioned Jesus within 150 years of the life of Jesus. People like Celsus, who was a strongly anti-Christian Greek philosopher. People like Tacitus, who was a Roman senator and a historian who often etched the events and the life of Jesus in his writings alongside the Jewish Talmud that Again, affirm many of the events and claims that the New Testament holds about Jesus. And somebody might be watching online or sitting here thinking like, Whoa, uh, big deal. To which our response, to, it's actually an enormously big deal what I'm, what I'm sharing right now. Because let me, let me give you an example. Uh, Tiberius Caesar, for example. Come on, how many ever heard of Caesar? Come on, somebody. Like the Roman emperor, top dog, who lived during the time of Jesus. Do you know how many sources there are that affirm the existence of Tiberius Caesar? Nine. Nine total sources that can, that's the only way we know that this guy ever lived. Is you gotta go back to history. What's about him? Are, 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 are these sources validated? There are nine total sources that affirm the existence of Tiberius Caesar. And Jesus, come on somebody, has 10 non-Christian sources that affirm his existence. Jesus 
is mentioned by one more source than the Roman emperor in a time of Roman rule. And mind you, again, we're not even including the Bible here. Because if you include the Bible in Christian sources, authors that mention Jesus outnumber Tiberius Caesar 43 to 9. Come on, somebody. Can I give you a historical fact? Somebody named Jesus came and made a serious impact on this world. Listen, just in light of the, the, the non-Christian references, putting the Bible aside, the theory that Jesus did not exist is absolutely unreasonable and crazy. Because how could non-Christian writers collectively reveal a storyline that lines up with and is totally parallel with the claims of the New Testament of your Bible if Jesus never existed? Non-Christian sources reveal claims, like come on, the, the, the 10 non-Christian sources that affirm Jesus existed also affirm and reveal and validate claims that number one, Jesus lived during the time of Tiberius Caesar. Number two, that he lived a virtuous life. Number three, that he was a wonder worker. And if you're taking notes, don't hurt your hand. I got all this for you in the message notes in your app. That number four, he had a brother named James. Uh, number five, he was acclaimed to be the Messiah, meaning savior. Number six, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. Number seven, he was crucified on the eve of Jewish on the eve of Jewish Passover. Number eight, all sources affirm that darkness and an earthquake happened the very moment he died on the cross. It's historical fact. Non-Christians even affirm that. Number nine, that his disciples believed he rose from the dead. Ten, his disciples were willing to die for that belief. 11, Christianity spread rapidly as far as Rome after the crucifixion. And number 12, he was worshiped as God. These are what non-Christian sources reveal to be accurate. Friend, if you've ever had any doubt that he lived, let me help you. He came, he lived, and he died for you, and he made such an impact with his life that it caused his name to be mentioned four and a half times more than the leader of the entire world during the time that he lived. According to history, I don't care what you think, that's huge. But my question is, if he was just an ordinary man, why so much press? Come on, if he was just an ordinary man that lived an ordinary life, did ordinary things, why would Rome commission and allow their historians to cite his life and the impact of his life about him? Because not only did he live, but the miracles he did while he was here have been validated as historically accurate as well, which we'll talk more about next week when we look at the Bible. All right, so we could sit here all day and validate the fact that Jesus lived, but let's talk about the big event. Right, this one, did he really resurrect? Come on, did he live again? What does history have to say about that? Did Jesus Christ really resurrect from the dead? First, let's zero in on what scholars have to say on the subject. Come on, somebody, scholars. How many would like to be called a scholar, right? I would, I'm not, but I'd like to be called one. Like people who have dedicated their entire life toward educating themselves on a given field or topic of study. Historical scholar Gary Habermas recently completed what many have cited to be the most comprehensive, detailed investigation to date on what scholars believe, not what you and I believe, what scholars believe about the resurrection of Jesus. And, and Habermas grabbed 1,400 of the most critical scholarly works of investigation on the resurrection. Not those that are in support of it, like 1,400 of the most critical ones uh, that have been written in the last 50 years. And Habermas reports that virtually all scholars, from ultra-liberals to Bible-thumping conservatives, agree Come on, somebody. I mean, oh, that's a miracle right there. Somebody say agree. That they all agree that the following concerning Jesus and Christianity are historical fact, not theory. They affirm that this is historical fact. Are you ready? Number one, that Jesus died by Roman crucifixion. Number two, that he was buried in a private tomb. And number three, that soon after his death, the disciples 
were completely discouraged and bereaved, having lost all hope. But concerning the claims of his resurrection, all scholars agree, number one, that Jesus' private tomb was found empty three days after he died. Number two, that the disciples had what they believed were actual appearances of the risen Jesus to them. Number three, that through this claimed experience, these disciples were dramatically transformed to the point where they were willing to die for this belief when faced with death for preaching it. Number four, word of the resurrection spread very early after his death, that it was not an added tale to the story 100 years later. In fact, the disciples' public testimony and preaching of the resurrection took place in Jerusalem, which is where Jesus was crucified and was buried shortly before, right? The resurrection. They also affirm, number five, that every time we have record of the disciples' preaching, it includes a death and a resurrection. And number six, that James, the brother of Jesus, was extremely skeptic before this time, and he was converted when he believed he also saw the risen Jesus. These are what skeptics rise to agree on. But for the sake of being fair to the other side of the room who say that Jesus did not resurrect, let's look at those objections. Let's look at their arguments and their claims. And we gotta go back to week one when I say this, right? Because if you're gonna make a truth claim, then you've gotta put some evidence to back up that truth claim that you're basing it on. If you're gonna say Jesus didn't rise, what evidence do you have that he didn't rise? We have evidence that we say he did. What evidence and argument do you have that says that he did not? I'm gonna give you the most frequent and used arguments given by skeptics on how Jesus Christ could not have risen from the dead. Number one, this one right here, the hallucination theory. And mind you, there's a few others, but I'm giving you the four most used, which claims that the disciples believed they were seeing a risen Jesus, but what they were actually seeing were hallucinations of the risen Jesus. Like perhaps they, they sincerely, th- I mean, nobody questions whether or not they sincerely thought it because of the transformation that happened afterwards but they were hallucinating, and if you really wanna see something, you can see it, and first, this theory has many flaws, but let me give you just a couple so you can know how to move around that point. Number one, hallucinations are not experienced by groups. They're experienced by individuals. Physicians say hallucinations are a lot like dreams, solely individual experiences. Come on, if you're married, you don't wake up in the morning and your spouse looks at you and goes, that was an amazing dream we had last night, wasn't it? And you don't go, sure was, baby. Let's dream it again tonight, you know? Now, dreams, like hallucinations, are not collective experiences. They are individual. So the only way that this theory would have legs is if every single person somehow hallucinated the exact same encounter with the resurrected Jesus with the exact people that were claimed to be in the room when he showed himself to them. And that would be so difficult to do because Christ was recorded as having appeared to a variety of different people in a variety of different settings over a 40-day period of time, men and women. He's seen walking with people, talking, eating food with people. A total of 500 people were recorded as having seen the risen Jesus within that 40-day period of time after he resurrected doesn't really have legs to stand on. Number two, the witnesses went to the wrong tomb. Now, you know, perhaps they just, they forgot where he was buried. And my rebuttal to this argument is really all Rome would have to do is go to the right tomb and go wrong, he's right here, right? And then parade his body and go, he's been here this whole time. He's not alive like you say that he is. And going to the wrong tomb would be so difficult because, friend, the the tomb where Jesus was buried was known by people. Jesus was recorded as being buried in a borrowed tomb, borrowed from a man named Joseph of Arimathea. He was a member of the Sanhedrin Council. This was a known man. This was a known location. It's not like you could have just forgot where you put him. And so this theory really has no legs. Number, number three would be something called the apparent death theory. 
Is it possible that Jesus didn't really die? Our rebuttal, of course, would be really simply just look at Rome's historical writings on what actually crucifixion entailed. Rome, under their death penalty system, was very thorough to ensure that their victims breathe their last breath. Alongside Josephus' writings and other, again, nine other historical non-Christian sources prove and describe in detail affirming the death of Jesus Christ. That there's no way he lived after a moment like that. Plus, again, without for the sake of being too gory, you go into Roman crucifixion, it is a gory experience. Lastly, uh, the disciples stole the body. Now this is a popular theory and I'm sure many of you have heard this one before, I know I have. My issue with this theory is, is this. Um, that would have to mean, if this is true, if they stole the body, that would have to mean that all of the New Testament writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, along with the other disciples of Jesus and the rest of that spiritual community, um, would have to have worked together to create this lie, this massive lie, which, in, which would have had to have involved stealing the body of Jesus that was underneath Roman guard watch. So how are you getting past those guys, number one? And, and then being able to take that body, hide it, bury it, burn it, or do whatever with it, and then for some inexplicable reason, get themselves beaten, tortured, and ultimately killed for committing to this lie. I, I mean, a normal thinking person would have to agree there's no reason to do this why would the disciples who were already bereaved immensely in this moment decide to embark on such a self-defeating conspiracy? I mean, conspiracies throughout history exist to self-promote, not self-defeat. It's not like Peter was like, hey guys, I got this crazy idea and I want you to hear me out. Let's steal his body, hide it, lie about it, and then let's every single one of us undergo the most torturous, horrible, and disgusting death and set of circumstances we could ever go through and get killed for believing it. Come on, who's with me? Hands in, let's go, ready? Like, who's, who's gonna, this, this theory is, is, is diminished by the proven records of history that, that say that the disciples themselves to his family, to the Roman guards and many Jews who all saw Jesus down the cross and claimed that they saw him rise from the dead does not allow that to ever hold hands with this claim. Friends, how though do you prove such an event to a skeptic or to one that's just genuinely asking the question, did he rise from the dead? How do you answer that question and prove that event happened 2,000 years after it happened? You wanna know how you do that? You have to provide an authentic record of eyewitness testimony. A historical, authentic record of eyewitness testimony. A reliable record of people who say they saw him resurrected with their own two eyes and collaborate the evidence from there. That's how you do it. And so I wanna go back to James, the brother of Jesus, who was recorded in history as being a skeptic himself. Come on, I mean, what brother wants to believe that their brother is the Messiah of all mankind? That would be the worst surrender in the world. Yes, big brother, I believe that you're the Messiah of the entire world. Come on. <laughs> I mean, no, probably the last person that's gonna believe that is your brother, amen. He was a skeptic. Even to the cross, he was a skeptic. What experience would one have to have to, in order to one day being a skeptic of the fact that Jesus, his own brother, wasn't who he says he was, to the point in 62 AD where history records that James was willing to die for that belief that he not only resurrected, but that he was God. My only thought could be, 
If the resurrection did not happen, why die for it? Why hold such a claim to be true even when James, the brother of Jesus, was put on his knees with the threat of being stoned to death and was asked, James, simply confess the truth that he did not resurrect. Come on, James, this is all a great story. You had your fun with your friends, but you are ruining religion and you are ruining government. Now out with the truth. And when he was faced with death, James looked back at his accusers and said, I cannot deny that which I have seen. He lives. You can only conclude through that moment that James was either the most stubborn liar on the planet or what he said must have been true. James was at that time the leader of the church in Jerusalem. And he could not deny it, friends. Come on, see this with me. And because of his refusal to deny it, James was arrested and brought to the top of the southeast pinnacle of the temple. And he was thrown 100 feet off of that temple, plummeting down to his demise. Why? Because he refused to deny his testimony of seeing Jesus resurrected. Now here's what's wild. History records that James miraculously survived that fall. Only for his enemies to come rushing to him. And they gave him one last chance. Tell us the truth. What you've been saying has been a lie to which James somehow was able to utter the words, I cannot deny that which I have seen. And history records him being beaten to death with a fuller's club and sent into eternity. You know, James, the brother of Jesus, wasn't the only person to undergo such a faith test. There's another disciple named James, if you know. He's the same, he was the son of Zebedee, or John. And the martyrdom of James, son of Zebedee, is actually recorded in Acts chapter 12 of your Bible. He was executed by being beheaded with a sword by order of King Agrippa I in the year 44 AD. In fact, it was said to be such an emotionally and spiritually stirring moment that Eusebius writes that the Roman officer who was ordered to guard James stood amazed in that moment before the judge while James defended his testimony of seeing a risen Jesus at his trial as James, son of Zebedee, looked to the judge and says, I cannot deny that which I have seen. He is risen, he is alive. That Roman officer was so impacted that after James was beheaded, that Roman officer went and knelt beside James's body, overcome by conviction. That Roman officer accepted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior right there at the dead body of James, son of Zebedee. Only to then also, by order of that judge, experience the same fate as that Roman officer was killed only being a five-minute old Christian. Peter, who, as you know, made a stir for Jesus in this world. After the day of Pentecost, Peter went and turned the world upside down for Jesus, and he was eventually captured and imprisoned in complete darkness in the A.D. 60s. He was ordered to be crucified on an X-shaped cross, and according to historians, Peter was crucified upside down. Why? Because he begged his tormentors that he felt unworthy to die the same way that Jesus died. And so he said, would you please take my life by crucifying me upside down? I'm not worthy to die in the same way that Jesus Christ, my Savior, died. 
Philip was crucified according to the Fox's Book of Martyrs. He preached the gospel of Jesus Christ in Upper Asia. Everywhere he went, where he finally suffered martyrdom in Helopius and Phrygia, he was scourged, thrown into prison, and afterwards he was crucified while being stoned. It was said to be the ultimate act of hatred ever seen in that region in AD 54. Thaddeus was crucified according to the Fox's Book of Martyrs. He was the brother of James where he was crucified in Edessa in AD 72. And all he was asked was deny that which you have said, to which Thaddeus responds to his tormentors, I cannot deny that which I have seen. He lives. Simon the Zealot, according to the Fox's Book of Martyrs, his surname was Zelotes. He preached the gospel in Africa and what is known as Britain today, where history records that he was crucified and later sawed in half in AD 74 with both sides of his body going to the outer gates of that city to warn anyone to preach that same message within their city gates. Matthew, who once collected taxes for Rome, was killed with a spear and with a halberd. According to Fox's Book of Martyrs, the former tax collector went and turned Parthia and Ethiopia upside down for Jesus. He preached everywhere he went where he was finally captured, asked to deny it, to which Matthew said, I cannot deny that which I've seen. He lives. He was run through with a spear and later slain with something called the halberd in the city of Nadaba, Ethiopia in AD 60. Then there's Bartholomew. According to Eusebius, who was a Christian writer who lived during the fourth century, Bartholomew traveled all over the place preaching and leaving behind copies of the Gospel of Matthew. Come on, extra, extra, read all about it. You have to hear the story of our God who sent his son into the world to die and live again for us. I saw him with my own two eyes, Bartholomew said. He was captured in modern-day Turkey where history records that he was filleted to death with a whip. Why? For simply sharing that which he has seen. Then you have Andrew. Andrew was recorded as having been martyred in Petrae, Western Greece. According to the Catholic Encyclopedia, it is generally agreed that he was crucified by order of the Roman governor, Aegeus. Here's what's wild, when he was crucified, he wasn't nailed to his cross. Andrew was bound to it with ropes in order to prolong his sufferings and give him an opportunity to deny what they called the lie that he had been sharing. But he did not deny it on that cross. And on November 30th, AD 60, his followers reported that actually when Andrew was led to the cross, he uttered these words. He saluted it and said, I have long desired and expected this happy hour. The cross has been consecrated by the body of Christ hanging on it. May my life on it further that message where it is said that he continued to preach to his tormentors from that cross for days until he expired. John faced martyrdom when he was boiled 
in a basin of boiling oil three separate times during a wave of persecution from Rome. However, John was miraculously delivered from death and survived each of those attempts, where he was then sentenced to the mines of the prison island of Patmos, where he wrote the book of Revelation on that island. The apostle John was later freed and returned to serve as the bishop of Edessa in modern day Turkey, where John died as an old man. He is the only one of Jesus' disciples that died a natural death, but not without his share of scars. And lastly, there's Thomas, or as we've heard him called, Doubting Thomas. Might I encourage you that those words could not be further from the truth. You see, Thomas was killed, according to the Fox's Book of Martyrs, with a spear run through him. He preached the gospel in Parthia and in India, where he was experiencing such community change that he was exciting the rage of the pagan priests. They captured him and they martyred him by thrusting him through with a spear. And some records in history say that after he was killed, he was dipped in tar and carried through the city in parade form to warn anyone else to follow in his path. Friends, the death of these disciples, Journey Church does nothing but put steel in the spine of my spirit and in my backbone. This is why I run. Because I submit to you today in this service that I have more evidence for a risen Jesus Christ than any atheist could ever bring to you to say that he did not. <laughs> that he not only lived, that he not only died, but that he lived again and he is the Lord and Savior of the world from the first day of history to the last. <laughs> Would you stand with me today? Can I ask you a question in this room before we go? And just in reverence and honor of this moment, could you just bow your heads with me and close your eyes in this moment? Is he your Lord and is he your Savior? Would you today allow you the opportunity to give him your life to save, forgive, make whole, and provide heaven forever to. Your Bible says in Romans chapter 10 and verse 9 that if you would confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in your heart, watch this, that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Will you take a moment, if you haven't done that, if you're here in this room or watching online and you're, you're saying, Pastor, I wanna, I wanna do that. I want to ensure that I am as, as sure for heaven as if I was already there. I wanna give Jesus Christ the belief of my heart and the confession of my mouth in this moment that I would have eternal life with him. If that's you in this place and you say, I'd like to give my life to Jesus today. I'm gonna count to three. When I say three, would you just put your hand up? One, two, three. Anybody in this room? Thank you, thank you. Hands come up all across this room. Thank you, thank you. Wow, wow. Once you put them up, you can put them right back down. Thank you so much. Anybody else? I wanna give my life to Jesus today. I wanna make him my Lord and Savior. I want you to pray this prayer with me. Somebody say, what's so special about this prayer? Nothing special about the prayer. It's who we pray to that's special. And it's the heart that's praying it that's special. Would you just say these words and mean them in your heart? Come on, let's all say this together. Lord Jesus, 
I believe you bled and died for me. I believe you rose again for me. And so today, I receive your forgiveness over my life. And I receive eternal life with you in heaven. Thank you for loving me like no one else could and for giving me heaven forever with you like no one else could. Help me to follow you from this day forward. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Friends, if you prayed that prayer for the first time in your heart here at home, your Bible says that you are saved in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Come on, let's give it up for those that made that eternal decision today. Hallelujah. How many know there's nobody like Jesus? Amen. And let's just close this service today just speaking the name of Jesus. Oh, God, how many know Jesus is the only hope for the world? Come on, he's the only answer for the hope of the world, amen? Let's just speak Jesus in and around our lives. Let's close today just singing that out today. Hallelujah.